1614, the year 1614, an Indian whose nickname was Squanto, I cannot pronounce his Indian name, so we'll stick with Squanto. He was kidnapped in the area of Cape Cod Bay by the British explorer Thomas Hunt. Thomas Hunt took him with some other Indians to Spain, and he was sold to the local monks. Now, they bought him because they wanted to educate him and evangelize what they believed to be a savage from America. Five years later, in 1619, Squanto was able to travel back to America, to his native village, only to find that his entire tribe had died in an epidemic. And I spent two hours researching how he got back to America. I could never find it, and I gave up. So he made his home, once he got back to America, with another Indian tribe living in the Cape Cod Bay area. Now, I have a question for you. What are the odds that an Indian would be captured, taken to Spain, learn how to speak the English language, learn about God, go back to his native land, and live in the area where the Mayflower would land the next year in 1620. Would you say Squanto had been prepared by God to be an interpreter, a guide, an advisor to the pilgrims? That's exactly what he was, teaching them how to grow crops, how to sustain themselves in the new land with animal skins and so forth and so on. Deuteronomy 31.18 says that we're not to be discouraged, for the Lord will personally go ahead of us. He'll be with us. He won't fail us. He won't abandon us, which makes me wonder why is it so difficult to trust him? Over and over, in far too many recorded instances for doubt to exist, we see the hand of God directing the rise and the greatness of this nation. The pilgrims knew that it was only by the goodness, the graciousness, the mercy, the intervention of God that they survived that first year in the wilderness, which is why when they were well prepared for the second winter, they declared a Thanksgiving Day feast. Quote, among the Christian exiles who first fled to America and sought an asylum from royal oppression and priestly intolerance were many who determined to establish a government upon the broad foundation of civil and religious liberty. Their views, later, found place in the Declaration of Independence, which sets forth the great truth that all men are created equal and endowed with the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. These princip principles are the secret of our nation's power and prosperity. Great Controversy, page 441. For the next 100 years, the oppressed and the downtrodden throughout Christendom flooded into this land as God worked in a marvelous manner and spread his shield of omnipotence over it. Testimonies to Ministers, page 206. Millions sought its shores, and the United States rose to a place of among a place among the most powerful nations 
on earth. Great Controversy, page 441. But it did not come easily. In 1775 to 1783, we fought a revolutionary war against Great Britain in order to become an independent, sovereign nation with the right to govern ourselves. God intended America to be an asylum for the oppressed and the persecuted. But Satan was able to afflict our nation with the sin of slavery. So beginning in 1860, we fought internally from state to state. So the phrase, all men are created equal, would actually mean something. And I will tell you, there is no way, there was no way under heaven that God was going to let slavery ruin his plan for this nation. There was absolutely no way the South was going to win the Civil War. I will give you just one example, and there are far more if you want to go study. One example of God's intervention. By the way, this is one of the most best books I've ever read. You can get it at the Book and Bible House. On August 3, 1861, a few months after the Civil War had begun, Ellen White was given a vision of the Battle of Manassas. It is ex as exciting reading as any novel I've ever read. Testimonies, Volume 1, page 264 to 268. She says this, At the conference at Roosevelt, New York, when we were assembled for fasting and prayer, the Spirit of the Lord rested upon us, and I was taken off in vision and shown the sin of slavery, which has so long been a curse to this nation. I had a view of the disastrous battle at Manassas, Virginia. The Southern Army had everything in their favor and were prepared for a dreadful contest. The Northern Army was moving on. They did not expect so fierce an encounter. Just then, an angel descended and waved his hand backward. Instantly, there was confusion in the ranks. It appeared to the northern men that their troops were retreating. So everybody started to retreat, and the battle ended with the north in a hasty retreat. Then it was explained that God had this nation in his own hand. That battle would have been a great triumph in the South. God would not permit this and sent an angel to interfere. Testimonies, Volume 1, page 264 to 268. In the very midst of the Civil War, after losing more than 600,000 men 50,000 at the Battle of Gettysburg alone. Abraham Lincoln mandated a national Thanksgiving holiday to be separate, to be celebrated on the last Thursday in November of each year to remember that our nation exists by the grace of God and any bounty we enjoy comes directly from him. As America rose from the ashes, literally, of the Civil War, we then fought two world wars to free us from tyranny. We also fought what history calls a Cold War to remain free from communism. Then we fought with the frightening unseen enemies to free the world of terrorism. All this is to say we did not arrive where we are today by our own efforts. We're sitting here this morning on a beautiful Sabbath day with freedom to preach, with freedom to evangelize the world. And we did none of it by our own strength. 
God set up America as a nation as prophesied in Revelation 13 and provided all the resources necessary to make this the most prosperous and the freest nation on earth for one reason. One reason only. God intended this rich, free nation to be the center of evangelism for the world. This country became the center of the great Advent movement. It was here that the prophecy of the first angel's message had its most direct power and fulfillment. The writings of Baptist lay pastor William Miller and his associates were carried to distant lands. Wherever missionaries had penetrated in all the world were sent the glad tidings of Jesus' speedy return. Far and wide from the shores of this nation spread the message of the everlasting gospel. Great Controversy, page 368. The greatest and most favored nation upon earth is the United States. A gracious providence has shielded this country and poured up on her the choicest of heaven's blessings. Here the persecuted and oppressed have found refuge. Here the Christian faith in its purity has been taught. This people have been the recipients of great light and unrivaled mercies. Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 4, page 398. You know what? Sometimes it's really easy to forget who is behind every blessing we enjoy in our personal lives, in our church, in our nation. We tend to forget all of us were immigrants at one point. Not you, but your granddads and your great-granddads. And that we are in this nation by the grace of God. Thanksgiving is unique. It's a unique American holiday. We actually forget what it's about. In all the commercialization of the holidays, we tend to forget the meaning of Thanksgiving Day, that it memorializes the struggle for freedom from the pilgrims to the war on terror, and it symbolizes our ongoing struggles for liberty in the future. Thanksgiving is our day to acknowledge God as the source of every blessing we've got, the tremendous, wonderful peace and prosperity God has created for everyone living in the United States. Do you know, and I've been on seven mission trips, do you know that our poor people, the poorest Americans, take for granted education, electricity, electrical appliances, bathrooms, modest living quarters, automobiles, do you know these things are considered luxuries that only the very rich can afford in many, many countries of the world? We certainly experienced it in Africa. Just amazing. We visited our driver. He was appointed our driver by the conference, the Adventist conference there, because he was one of the very few members that had a car. So he would drive me out to where I was speaking in Niamachi. And he and his wife invited my husband and I to their house. Their house was about as big as this platform here, maybe 12 by 12. The floors were mud. It was a hut with grass roof. And they were thrilled to have us. They said, you're the only white people that have ever been to our village and into our home. And we were very flattered. 
but you stood there and it was all I could do not to cry because they were so happy with what they had. And our poor people have so much more than the rest of the world. Today, we're the most scientific, high-tech, industrialized nation on earth with the most available resources. We're the most educated, prosperous people on earth. We control the largest military operation on earth with the most sophisticated communication systems and satellites orbiting. We can send messages to all nations in this world in a nanosecond. And God is the source of all of this prosperity that we enjoy. And we've been given all these blessings to carry out one directive from God, just one. He said, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach them to obey all that I have commanded you. And he doesn't expect us to do it by ourselves. He says, I'm with you. Be right there until the end of the world, to the end of the age, when I come back. Let me ask you something that I ask myself. I've really been into this for several weeks. What are we doing? What am I doing individually? What are you doing with the personal resources God has given you to fulfill this one commission we've been given by God? What have we done with our money, our time, to put the message, God's end time message, the three angels' message, out to Charlotte. We don't have to worry about the whole world. We just have to worry about where we live. It's so easy to forget that you and I, God's people, we are America. We are his church. Christians are God's only witness in this world. And we should never take freedom in our individual and national abundance for granted. <laughs> And we should never believe we deserve it. Ted Koppel, a broadcast news journalist, spent 20 years as ABC's news anchor. He moved with his parents from Germany to England right before World War II. He had lived through rationing, no food, scarcity, desperation, and a few years later, they were able to move to the United States. When young Ted heard a jingle on the radio advertising an antacid that could heal the pain of overeating, he started to cry. He couldn't imagine that he now lived in a place where people had problems overeating. Unlike any age in history of the world, we live in a society where we have everything that money and technology can give us. Are we thankful? Are we really thankful? But then Jesus had a problem with unthankfulness too, didn't he, in Luke 17, 11 to 19. He was on his way back from Jerusalem and he passed through a village. Ten lepers come running to him and saying, Master, Master, have mercy on us. And Jesus told them, okay, go show yourselves to the priest and let them confirm your healing. The Bible tells us that only one leper returned to thank Jesus for his healing. One author suggested that nine didn't return to thank Jesus because one waited to see if the cure was real. One waited to see if uh, it would actually last. One said he'd see Jesus later. One decided he probably never had leprosy in the first place. One said he probably would have gotten well anyway. One gave glory to the priest. One said, oh well, Jesus didn't really do anything. One said any rabbi could have done it. One said, well, I was already much improved. And so just like the lepers... We often rationalize the good things that happen to us. 
yeah, y'all prayed for me, but I'd probably gotten well anyway. Yeah, I didn't get fired. They laid off half the force. I probably wouldn't have been laid off anyway. We rationalize what God does for us. We have so much that you wonder how any of us can fix our eyes on Jesus and heaven and long for a better land when we're living in a better land right now. And my fear is, and believe me, I have a fear for my grandchildren. My fear is it's going to cause us, this entire generation of children, who have never wanted for anything in their lives to miss heaven. Are you aware that last month in October, did you see the statistics? Last month, you, me, not me, maybe you, hopefully not, we spent 10.14 billion with a B dollars on Halloween, decorations, candy, that's up from 8.05 billion last year. Two more billion dollars were spent this year. 27% of the 10.14 billion was spent on Halloween costumes. I challenge you, I challenge me, I challenge all of us. If you're listening on the radio, I challenge you put into the offering plate of your church the exact amount of money you spent on Halloween this year on candies, decorations. It's Satan's holiday, as we all know. Why would any Christian give it five cents? Between Halloween and Christmas, America is on track to spend one trillion, with a T, dollars. They estimate $6.1 billion of that will be spent on Christmas trees. $15.2 billion, over twice what we spend on Christmas trees, will be spent in unwanted gifts. If you divide the $1 trillion they anticipate will be spent by the United States population of 323.1, million, that average is a little bit, it's about $3,095 per person in the United States. Okay, considering that every single day 25,000 people die of starvation every day in this world, doesn't it sound obscene that we spend one trillion dollars during this season? And my husband didn't believe this. He said, I, I question this. I said, don't question. I can show it to you. Because 56% of Christmas spending goes into gift cards. Because nobody really needs anything. And we don't know what to give, so we give a gift card. Shouldn't we pause? Shouldn't we ask ourselves, what are we doing? Why are we doing it? Is this what God wants out of his people that he's blessed so much? Asking us just to simply go in the world and preach the gospel? You know, you know it. Every breath we take, every heartbeat we enjoy comes directly from God. We should be glorifying God with all our praise. Thankfulness is a state of mind in constant acknowledgement of our dependence on God. You know, the very fact that we can expect our children to grow up, that was not true 100 years ago. The very fact that you and I can plan to live to an old age should cause us every day to thank God. You know, I want to share a poem with you that I have kept since college. Uh, I read it in college. I've never, it's forgive me when I whine. Today upon a bus I saw a lovely maid with golden hair. I envied her. She seemed so gay. And oh, I wished 
I were so fair. When suddenly she rose to leave, I saw her hobble down the aisle. She had one foot and wore a crutch. But as she passed, a smile, oh God, forgive me when I whine. I have two feet, the world is mine. And when I stopped to buy some sweets, the lad who served me had such charm. He seemed to radiate good cheer. His manner was so kind and warm. I said, it's nice to deal with you. Such courtesy I seldom find. He turned and said, oh, thank you, sir. And I saw that he was blind. Oh, God, forgive me when I whine. I have two eyes. The world is mine. Then when walking down the street, I saw a child with eyes of blue. He stood and watched the others play. It seemed he knew not what to do. I stopped a moment and I said, why don't you join the others, dear? He looked ahead without a word and then I knew he couldn't hear. Oh God, forgive me when I whine. I have two ears, the world is mine. With feet to take me where I'd go, with eyes to see the sunset glow, with ears to hear what I should know, I'm blessed indeed. The world is mine. God forgive me when I whine. Even living in the greatest, most prosperous nation on earth, we're used to thinking in terms of scarcity, not abundance. We, we tend to think there's never enough to go around. News reports warn us if we don't exercise careful stewardship of our natural resources, we're going to run out of clean water and food and oil and land and so forth, which isn't going to happen. It is political nonsense. And it is being pushed by Pope Francis, who is calling every nation for a green Sabbath for the earth and the poor. Look it up. How do I know this is nonsense? It's political nonsense. Because I believe the word of God. Psalms 24, 1 says, The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. So you think anything we can do, and God is helpless and hopeless, God will take care of the world he created. Many of us are haunted by the fear that we're just a few paychecks away from falling through the cracks. We can't give to the church. Many think, I can't even pay my tithes. Hmm, what will I do? We've got to guard our money. It's Satan that makes us believe there's never enough. Never enough to help others. Never enough enough to make us feel truly secure. It's Satan that encourages us to hold on to what we have, hoard it, hide it, make sure me and mine never run short. Christians, on the other hand, celebrate our abundance. The spirit of thanksgiving creates in us an abundance mindset. When we focus on the positives of life, we automatically feel thankful. The more thankful we feel, the more joyful we feel. And it's contagious. We overflow. We want to share with others. Did you know that Jesus told a story in Luke 12 that gives us his perspective on our abundance and hoarding? It's come down through 2,000 and some years now, known as the rich fool story. Jesus began the story. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. The man thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store all my excess crops. He thought to himself, the man said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and I'll dig bigger ones. And there I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. I want you to note there was absolutely nothing wrong with his past investments in the appropriate number of barns that he had to contain his yearly harvest and care for his family. It's appropriate 
for every family to have a financial plan and goals and a budget and insurance and a savings. We should all take care of our families. The point of Jesus' story was that God had provided an overabundant harvest that the man felt entitled to with no responsibility whatsoever to anybody else. Like many people, he believed that whatever he earned was totally his. When in fact, the Bible clearly tells us in Deuteronomy 8.18, remember, it's the Lord your God. He's the one that gives you the ability to get wealth. You don't get it by yourself. Actually, according to the Bible, None of us owns anything. 1 Corinthians 10, 26, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. Whatever we have is on loan to us by God. And we have the privilege of being stewards. Our management is supposed to include not just ourselves, but those around us. Jesus said, if anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need, but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? 1 John 3, 17. So what did this man blessed with a huge surplus of grain do that God condemned? He immediately began figuring out how to hoard it for himself. He was blessed with so much that he wanted to figure out how to stockpile it. Luke 12, verse 20 says, But God said to him, You fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? Notice that nowhere in the story did Jesus condemn the man for eating and drinking and being merry. God wants us to live an abundant life. Nor does Jesus condemn anyone for acquiring wealth. In fact, Matthew 25 gives us a parable about how to invest our money wisely. Jesus condemned the man for being selfish, stingy, and hoarding everything for himself, having no concern for others. Ephesians 4.28 says, we're to work that we may have something to share with those in need. This is what sets us apart from the world. And Jesus ended the story by showing how foolish it was to believe that hoarding a big windfall promised any kind of security. Thanksgiving and generosity go together. Philippians 2 4 says, Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. We're most like Christ when we are giving. We know that the only thing the Bible says demands from us is 10% of our income for tithe right off the top. Otherwise, the Bible just says, let each one of you give according to how I've blessed you. Not reluctantly, because God loves a cheerful giver. And we surely cannot outgive God. The very first person to reach the status of billionaire in America was a man who knew how to set goals and follow through. At the age of 23, he was a millionaire. By the age of 50, he was a billionaire. Every decision, attitude, everything he did was funneled into power and wealth. Three years later, at the age of 53, his body was racked with pain. He lost his hair. The world's richest man could only digest milk and crackers. He couldn't sleep. He wouldn't smile. And he lost all interest in life. The highly skilled physician said he would die within the year. One night he had a dream. And in the dream, Christ told him that he could not take any money with him into the next life. And he was left with a choice. He immediately the next day called his attorneys and accountants to his bedside and announced that he wanted to channel his assets to hospitals, research, and mission work. On that day, John D. Rockefeller established his foundation. His foundation led to the discovery of penicillin, cures for current strains of malaria, tuberculosis, diphtheria, and a whole long list since then. 
Rockefeller channeled his increase into a foundation that brought him an amazing after effect. When he gave back and established the foundation, his body chemistry was altered so significantly that he began to get better. It looked like he would die at 53. He lived to be 97. I believe with all my heart that being thankful to God for his blessings, thinking of others is the key to a long and prosperous life. Our share in church makes it easy to participate in serving others. First of all, we have WGFY radio. You can see it says on air right there. All of us should give regularly to the radio station. If you've only got $5 a month extra, you should give it to the radio. This is the greatest ministry beyond our walls that we've got. There are two million people in this area, all who listen to the radio. None of us can preach to two million people. But through that radio, we can. We get message after message. We will not know until we get to heaven how many people first heard about the Sabbath and Jesus coming through the radio. We're going to have a little mission spotlight after the children's story on the radio. I want you to listen to some of the stories they're going to tell you. We also support Angel Tree Ministry. Is Simone... Simone, I want Simone to stand. If you want to turn around and look at Simone, I'm sorry, Simone. This is Simone Watson. She runs Angel Tree each year for our church. We buy gifts, and on December 10, all the kids, the social service sends us, but their parents are incarcerated, and we provide them a Christmas. How can any of us say no to that? Simone is out in the lobby after church today. Twice in December and twice in January, we're going to go uptown and give socks, gloves, scarves, hats away to the homeless. This is Forrest Watson. Do you want to turn around and say, Forrest, raise your hand back there? This is Forrest Watson who runs this ministry. He's going to have a container out there. All of us can afford to buy a pair of socks or a hat or some gloves that we can put in that container that they're ready to give to the homeless people in downtown Charlotte. Women's ministries. Where's Sierra? Sierra, you want to stand up? This is our outstanding women's ministries leader as well as head elder of our Sharon Church. You will see the baskets out there that have already been assigned to people. They made the baskets this week. You say, well, the baskets are over. I don't have to give anything. Yes, you do. Put some money in an envelope for the next project women's ministries do for Charlotte. In each basket, by the way, is a book that will help in salvation if they'll read it. Hearts and Hammers is a thriving ministry by the men of our church. They help everyone in need. They go out a couple of Sundays a month and help anyone and they came and helped my husband and I when we were moving and we thoroughly enjoyed them where's David and Ricardo Uh, 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 Roberto is Roberto in here Roberto's up in the back and here's David Hernandez take a look at them if you are a man and you can donate a couple of hours on a Sunday this is a ministry you need to participate in They're doing a wonderful job helping people. You and I have the privilege of living in the greatest country in the world. God has blessed America because we are a Christian nation. With that blessing comes responsibility. We have a responsibility to carry out that great commission that he gave to us. In obeying that commission, America has become a missionary nation. God has blessed this obedience, allowed our freedom to continue. Right now, the window on our freedoms 
has begun to close, as you all know. We all know the prophecy. We need to use the time we have left and give and think about others and spread this message as we've never done before. Because if we do, God will continue to bless America.